Thank you for the introduction and I, I will start by my talk that the, the title is The Nuclear Gap D8 Intended Cascade in Cortical Microglia Regulates Behavioral Flexibility. So I will start by introducing what is behavioral flexibility and why it's important. So basically this is the cognitive construct that allow us to adapt to changing environment or circumstances. But the reason why I got initially interested in this construct is because it is known to be affected in many neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders. And as well, it is known to be affected during regular aging. But despite the importance of this cognitive behavior in so many diseases, the molecular and cellular mediators for the, it, this behavior are unclear. And very little is known, but we know some things. We know through ablation and functional MRI studies that the prefrontal cortex region of the brain is one of the regions more important for the regulation of this behavior. And all behaviors are affected by stress, but this is a, that this is a behavior that is particularly affected by stress. So working on the, the hypothesis that the psychological and psychosocial stress induce oxidative stress, I wanted to address if the nuclear gap the H cascade that is a sensor of oxidative stress can play a role in the regulation of this behavior. And I think like many people know that gap the H is one of the main enzymes involving glycolysis. But what many people don't know is that this enzyme is able to get post-translational modify within encounters oxidative or nitrosative stress. And when this happens, gap DH binds to CA1. This binding is important because CA1 is the protein that moves uh, gap DH to the nuclei. So for us, we have two different ways to intervene with this cascade. We have a pharmacological approach that is a drug we call RR that we demonstrated that is able to cross the BBB and reach the central nervous system. And as well, we have a genetic approach that is a point mutation in GAPDH that will block the binding between GAPDH and CIA. And we took advantage of that point mutation to create a conditional mouse model. So coming back to the scheme, both approaches will target this binding. If this doesn't bind, GAFDH won't move to the nuclei. So these are the main aims of this study. And for today, I will just focus on the preclinical aim in which what we are trying to see if is the nuclear GAFDH cascade can regulate behavioral flexibility. On the clinical side, what we are trying to propose are biomarkers that allow us to predict behavioral inflexibility on the clinic based on what we learn on the preclinical side. But as I told you for today, I will focalize on the preclinical aim. So with this, I introduced the preclinical mouse model that we use, that is a very simple model that consists on the that consists on consecutive injections of LPS, of intraperitoneal injections. And this is a model that has been used in the field as a model of inflammation and oxidative stress. I just want to highlight that I, in this model, every outcome measure I take is 24 hours after the last injection. So what I will be addressing in this mouse is a cognitive task and not sickness behavior. So with this, first thing I did it was to test how these animals perform on the behavioral flexibility task. This task has two main portions, the initial association and the rule shifting. And this rule shifting, this extradimensional shift, shifting is what it tell us how flexible the mice are. So what I found in my LPS mice is that they didn't present deficits on the initial association portion but they did present deficits on the rule shifting. As you can see, there are some variability on the performance of the LPS mice, but we consistently see deficits in these mice. So when we characterized that the LPS mouse model presented deficits, we decided to treat with the drug that blocks the binding between GABDH and CIA in order to see if the nuclear GABDH has an effect or has a role in the regulation in this behavior. And as you can see, the animals treated with RR perform uh, better. Like the panel on the right 
like highlights just the perseverance errors that tell us that the mice are not performing randomly, if not that they get a stick to what they previously learned on the previous task. So our at that point then what we knew is that the nuclear Gavdiets cascade is involved in a mechanism responsible for behavioral flexibility, but we wanted to know which cell types were involved in that regulation. So for that, I addressing the activation of this cascade paying in a cell type specific way, paying attention to microglia and astrocytes mainly that are the main cell types involved in the provocation and resolution of inflammatory effects. And it was very striking to see how microglia was the main cell type in which this activation was taking place. And what I'm showing in here are, is the binding between GAPD8 and CIA as a way to show activation of the nuclear GAPD8 cascade. But even more interestingly, was not all microglia that was activated, if not that it, it was more prone cortical microglia to be activated versus other brain regions. So we don't know if this tells us about different, um, different uh, 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 populations of microglia cells or if it is that the um, stress is higher in certain regions. But this will be in conjunction with the behavioral deficit we observe that we know is very prefrontal cortex driven. And this is just to show that there are works in vivo. So I corroborated these results as well using the sulfogabd antibody. That is another way to test activation in which we see that the signal of sulfogabd co-localizes with IVA1 and not with other signals ten, telling us that it's microglia specific. So next question was to know how microglia is controlling neural activity in order to regulate this behavior. And for that I performed a chipstick analysis against nuclear gap D8 to initially know more about the activation of this cascade. You have the results in here on the panel of the right, the peaks of occupancy. And with that, I ran an ingenuity pathway analysis to know common hubs or pathways regulated by gap D8. Um, the three first pathways are really interesting, but tell us more about the autonomic function of microglia under stress. And for this particular project, I got really interested on the fourth hit, on the regulation of HNDB1 and 2 signaling. And the reason why I got interested on that is because it has been described how HNDB proteins can bind to the NDA receptors and work as an agonist. So what I thought that it was happening is microglia Gap the, nuclear gap DH in microglia will be regulating HNDB proteins that will be secreted to the extracellular space and bind to the NMDA receptors of closed neurons. So first I tested that the results of my chip seek were true through different techniques. I, I did a chip uh, qPCR to test that the binding of uh, nuclear gap DH to the promoter of HNDB2 was actually true. And as well, I tested that this binding was functional and that is actually regulating HNDB proteins at uh, mRNA and as well at protein level. So next thing then was actually test if I could see then the, the activation of the neural cells in my system. And for that, I perform calcium imaging as an indirect measure of the NDA receptors. And long story short, what we found in here was that uh, we observed an increase of the firing rate in the uh, pyramidal neurons of the animals that were treated with LPS. And we were able to revert this effect when we treat the animals with RR, that is the, block, the drug that blocks the binding between gap and CIA. But as well, in order to, tell, to test causality of the HNDB proteins, we acutely treat the slice with an HNDB antibody that would theoretically block the binding between HNDB proteins and the NNDA receptors. And this was successfully as well revert the increase of firing rate we observed in the cells. But all of this is, was not the clear proof that 
microglia was the responsible cell for the regulation of these effect on neurons. And for that, we slightly changed our model for being able to back cross it with uh, our Nokin mouse line and specifically target the activation of the nuclear guardiates in microglia cells. Two things. In this model, initially, we reproduced the same effect we saw before. So the increase of firing rate is happening on the, on the cortical regions. And we decreased this effect when we block the activation of the cascade just on microglia cells. As well, with this genetic mouse model, we also saw how we are able to revert the deficits on the behaviors. So with all of this, what I told you today is that the nuclear Gavdiates cascade is specifically activated in cortical microglia in LPS mice and responsible for behavioral inflexibility. And that the nuclear Gavdiates transcriptionally regulates HNDB1 and 2 expression in microglia cells. As well, microglial and Gavdiates cascade regulates neural function through HNDB1 and 2 signaling. So with that, I just want to allow it my mentor Akira Sawa and all the people in my lab that participated in the study as well collaborators inside Hopkins and our funding sources. So thank you all of you and I will take any question. Thank you very much Adriana. Uh, let's wait for questions. Um, okay, so while we're waiting, can you tell us a little bit more about your plans now? Well, my plans, I like finished my postdoc, so now I'm like applying for jobs, I'm entering in the job market and seeing how that works, but maybe this was not the best year to enter in the job market. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's not the best timing for anything, so, so in that sense... <laughs> Let's be flexible, you know. <laughs> yeah, we're all in the same boat here. And uh, was this um, uh, project published? Uh, we submit, it's submitted. So, yeah, hopefully it gets out soon. Okay, oh, that's, that's wonderful. Good luck with that. Any more, um, any more projects that you, that you need to wrap up or you're done? Um, I mean, there are other directions, uh, all of them like related with microglia. For example, I'm very interested as well on um, addressing the metabolic function of microglia and how that can also be in relation with the regulation of neural function. So how the reprogrammation of the metabolism in microglia can affect the rest of the cells in the brain. It's been like one of... Uh, of the other lines and actually the line I want to take with me so yeah mm -hmm. okay all right good luck with that uh, we have one one more one question sorry from Kaleen Conrad do you think there are other non-neuronal cells that are regulating neuronal firing or do you think this is a micro this is microglia specific I do think it's microglia specific um Overall, like the genetic uh, rescue showing that microglia is crucial for this. What is true is that what I, I cannot be completely sure if it could be an effect, an, a, like an extra effect that could be as well mediated by astrocytes, for example, and that micro, the activation of the nuclear Gavdiates cascade is activating astrocytes that subsequently activate as well, have an effect on neurons, and there is like a, a, an additive mechanism. But what I do know is that microglia is the, if you target, if you block um, uh, the activation of this cascade in microglia is sufficient to revert the effect on neurons. So that's what I have. Thank, thank you, Adriana. Before we move on to the uh, third speaker, there was an unanswered question from you to Jake um, before. Do you want to repeat it or do you want to wait for later? Say again. I see that you had here a question. Yeah, I think I wrote it on the wrong, on the wrong yeah, slide. Yeah. 
Yeah, my question was like, if you think that these mechanisms you observe that vinyl is regulating uh, CPL3, do you think this is something specific that happens on the retina or do you think that this happens in other brain regions and in other neural cell types? Yeah, so I think complexin-3 specifically is probably only in the retina because it's basically only expressed in the retina at these ribbon synapses. And the only other place that it's really expressed is in hair cells, so maybe there as well. But one thing that I think is potentially interesting is that uh, the circadian clock could regulate maybe complexin-1 or, or 2 at conventional synapses, and no one's really looked at that at all. And so that's kind of one interesting direction, maybe. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, great. Thank you very much again, Adriana.